live from Soho Theatre in London. The sponsored end shop presents the guilty bonus with me, Deborah Frost's wife, in conversation with Yomi Adekake, talking about the list. Oh my God, hello, hello, hello. Here we are doing feminism on Friday fucking night. I mean, there are a lot of people who say they're feminists, but are they? No, they're in a pub getting smashed. Here we are, Friday night. We've worked a long week, but here we are smashing the patriarchy with a drink in our hand. That's right. We're proper feminists. We're feminists that 24-7 this shit. That's right. There is no rest for the well-intentioned. So just give us a cheer if you listen to The Guilty Feminist. Give us a cheer if you don't know what you're at. Notice how those cheers are less empowered. They're like uncertain, weren't they? Not really sure what I'm at. Yeah. Um, just give us a cheer. If, if you don't know what you're at, just, give, just, just wave at me. Does anyone not know where they're at? Anyone? Just give us a cheer if you don't listen. Nobody's willing to say. Oh, one, one wooer there. What's your name? Fuzia. Fuzia. Yeah. Great name. Uh, where's your accent from? France. France. This is London, Londra. This is Londra, um, and this is Soho Theatre. So, well, listen. Thank you for coming. Are you here specially, or, or are you? Were you here anyway? Uh, accidentally. You're accidentally in London, or you're accidentally at the show. Were you just? Did you just wander by and see there was a show on and thought feminism? That sounds like me. No, my friend chose for me. Your friend chose for you. Would you consider yourself a feminist? Okay, well, let's try and convert you. It's not a cult. Lock the doors. Um, listen, thank you for coming. Uh, just give us a cheer if you think your job has a feminist element. Yeah, I, I know there's more people than that because I know my audience by now and I know my audience are in three categories. One, people who work in a direct feminist role, um, something to do with social mobility, uh, literacy, something like that, uh, some kind of uh, role with refugees, some kind of... A... Then the second camp is sort of facilitary, making the world better generally, NHS teachers, that kind of thing. And the third group is are people doing PhDs about Virginia Woolf. <laughs> Just give us a cheer if you're doing a PhD about Virginia Woolf. Not quite. Not quite, but almost. What's your PhD in? The Me Too movement. The Me Too movement. Yes, exactly. I am not wrong. I'm not wrong. Um, so I'm just going to give you the mic so you can tell us about that. What's your name? Tatiana. Tatiana. Yes. Okay. So Tatiana, what is your PhD in? It is about the Me Too movement and the theatre. The Me Too movement and the theatre? Yes. But they, PhDs, they, the dissertation always has a really long name, doesn't it? Uh, well, <laughs> it's a current, Your friend's finding this, this actually not my friend. Well, she's my friend, but she's also my supervisor for my PhD. Oh. <laughs> She's finding it absolutely mortifying. Uh, well, it's a current working title, but it's currently titled, I suppose, um, The Me Too Movement in the Theater, Exploring Rape Culture, Sexual Harassment, and Sexual Assault. It's not funny at all. No. So, no. no. Yeah. Um, wow. And how long are you going to spend on that? As long as it takes. Yeah, you need a lot of self-care during that, I would yes. say. Yes, yeah. yeah. Or, or as someone said to me today, because I haven't rested much lately it's going to be self-care or intensive care. Yes. <laughs> and I was like, what a great point. I will go home and sleep tonight. Um, wow. Well, thank you for doing that. And uh, at what point are you going to be happy to come on The Guilty Feminist and tell us about it? Oh, at any point. I would at be any point. <laughs> oh, great. Okay, lovely. Well, we'd love to have you to talk about that. Because how long have you been doing it so far? Um, so far, almost a year. Almost a year. Yes. Okay. Have you found out things that we don't know? Possibly. I mean... <laughs> you don't know what we know. Yeah, yes, fair enough. Yes. Um, <laughs> Um, well, I'd be very interested. And your supervisor? This is my supervisor, who is, who is an amazing feminist as well. Oh, great. Okay, excellent. What's your name? I'm Michelle. Michelle. And are you a professor or a tutor? Or a... I'm an associate professor in drama. You're yes. a, an associate professor in drama. Yes. And you, so you already have a PhD, I assume? I do. What's your PhD in? Uh, it's actually nothing to do with feminism, really, but Sean O'Casey. Sean O'Casey, yes. disappointing for the feminists. Um, <laughs> But Is it in a white man? You've got a PhD in a white man. Uh, but he was Are you sure man. you're the right supervisor for this one? 
<laughs> she absolutely is. Was Sean O'Casey he, ever me too? He was no, very era. supportive of women and um, ran one of the campaigns to feed and support striking women and children in Ireland in the Dublin lockout. So he's definitely... He's one I of the David Attenboroughs of the world. Yeah, yeah. We'll, <laughs> we'll allow him. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, listen, uh, thank you very much. Which university is that at or is that too much uh, information? No, no, that's fine. It's at St. Mary's University in London. Great. Okay. Well, please, you know, come on when you've got a little bit more cooked and, uh, and tell us what you're learning because we would be absolutely fascinated to know. You will be very interested in our guest tonight because she's written a book called The List, which uh, has some of these themes in. Um, so I'm very excited. Um, big round of applause for Tatiana. <laughs> Does anyone think they have a more feminist job than Tatiana? Just give us a cheer. Anyone else got a feminist job? Anyone got what they think is an unfeminist job? Great. Oh, two people in the front row here. The other people very happy about it. Woo! Got an unfeminist job. That's right, people. What's your unfeminist job? I do marketing for BMW. You do marketing for BMW? Yes. Okay. Don't be sorry. Don't be sorry. People have got to make a living. But this is my question to you. Do you ever do stealth feminism within that job? Do you ever do anything to make BMW a bit more feminist? An example is uh, a woman recently told me in in the audience that she did like investments uh, for very rich people, but she would sometimes guide those investments towards feminist things while telling them they would make the best return on investment, even though they clearly would not. There was another woman who I'm pretty sure was embezzling, but for us, like Robin Hood. We do what we can. Acts of small resistance. Uh, Do you ever do any resistance? It's too early on, but I'm open to ideas. Too early on, but open to ideas. I call this feminist corruption, and it's important. So, okay, so if you've got any ideas for... What's your name? Alana. Alana. Do, do you want your name going out? Because then it's going to be very difficult to be stealthy. If somebody goes, isn't Alana in your department? I heard her on The Guilty Feminist last week. Apparently she's going to do some stealth feminism and start embezzling. Fire her now. So maybe we shouldn't say your name. We'll let's call you, they give you a different name. So just do a fake name. What's your name? Um, Angela. Angela. So if you hire an Angela at BMW, oh, I'd, I'd get worried. She might be going to do something. But if you hire people of other names, there's no worries there at all. <laughs> Just only Angela's need to be under suspicion. Oh, God, there's no Angela working there, is there? Because that's going to be really awkward. <laughs> and poor Angela is like walking out the next day with a, <laughs> the cardboard box going, I don't know what happened. I don't really identify as a feminist. Um, what's your own feminist job? I work for an advertising agency that specializes in B2B. B2B? Yeah. No one here knows what that is. Business to business. Business to business. That's what we call B2B. Why did we say B2B? It's just easier. Just too long to say business. It's just because business people don't like to say full words. They're just like HR, L&D, you know, FU. It's just... (laughs) B2B. So B2B. So you, you, you advertise businesses to other businesses. Do you ever do any stealth feminism? No, and that's why I'm here. No, and that's why I'm here, to learn. I think we need to start giving workshops in Trojan horse feminism. The trouble is, I do, I do Trojan horse stuff, but the trouble is my horse is always a feminist, which makes it a terrible Trojan horse. It's not a Trojan horse, just a feminist horse. And people come to the gate like a big horse dressed like a feminist with a sign that says, I'm a feminist. And he goes, can I come in the, through the gates? And no, you're a fucking feminist. It's like, I need to be better at disguising my Trojan horses. I need more Trojan, less horse. That's what I'm saying. Um, Anybody else got a feminist or an unfeminist job they want to tell us about? Yes, what's yours? We make film and media content bringing a narrative about women into the industry. That's what I do. Oh. So you make films and what VR content about women from history bringing them back to life? (gasps) VR, like what do you mean like the ABBA holograms? But you bring women back to life. So you're just like there with Emmeline Pankhurst and Maya Angelou having a chat, but it looks real. Like if you, I don't know if you've seen the ABBA Voyage show, but it looks like 1970s ABBA is on the fucking stage and it really makes you question death. <laughs> like, is there death now? No, not really, because you're a hologram. I, the, I could have died six months ago. You wouldn't know. 
I, this could be Guilty Feminist Voyage, as far as you know. You don't know, because that's how good it is. Are you doing that kind of thing? We are. <gasps> um, what? It's similar. It's actually, you can jump into the character's shoes you can, and you can be that person. You could jump into the character's shoes and be that person. So one is wow. a pirate queen who lived in China. A pirate queen that lived in China. So I'm just saying it again for the feminist audience at home. A pirate queen who lived in when? China. Early 1800s. Pirate queen. Surely usually a pirate or a queen. Queens don't normally need to be pirates. Just because they already have all the stuff. Most powerful pirates in the world. Um, But did she jump on other people's boats and kill them and take their stuff? Because that's not as feminist as all that. Like, I'm all for equal opportunities. I understand. I'm like, yeah, there's underrepresentation of female dictators. But I... I don't know, it's something I'm... It's not my main campaign, you know what I mean? So can I just inquire a little further into the pirate situation? What kind of piracy was she doing? Was it like just videotapes and stuff? Or was it... Was it worse? Was it doubloons and knifings? It was piracy, piracy. Piracy, piracy. But she also paved the way for equality in... She wrote a code of laws that meant that men and women had to be treated equally on the high seas or everywhere? In her fleet. In her fleet of pirates <laughs> who killed people and took their money. <laughs> she was like, but listen, g- <laughs> gender equality, if I'm going to knife one of you, I'm going to knife all of you. Every time I knife a man, I'm going to knife a woman for parity. <laughs> don't want any, any favouritism, it's just the same. Um, well, look, it sounds fascinating. Can we come somewhere and see it and be it? Yeah, absolutely. Where can we go? Uh, you can buy it on MetaQuest. You can buy it on MetaQuest, so you don't go to a building? No. No, I don't understand how the world works anymore, clearly. <laughs> I assumed it was like a, a place where you went, like a museum or something, like because like, I was thinking about a voyage. But this is something you do at home, is it? Like you just what? What do you mean you can what? just have a hologram at home and you get into their shoes? I don't understand. Oh, VR headset. I understand. I did VR once. It was absolutely fucking amazing. I went during the pandemic when we were hardly allowed to see anybody. You know those periods where you were allowed out of the house but only in a room with one other person? I went and did a VR comedy set. I had to put this headset on and then I had to come out onto the stage, which I wasn't really doing. I was just standing in front, but it looked like backstage there and it looked like I came out. So my memory is I was backstage and I came onto the stage and they said to me, We've got two avatars for you. One is just a sort of brunette woman about your height who looks like you in jeans and a T-shirt. And the other is like this fucking Jessica Rabbit, hot shot, <laughs> plunging neckline. And I was like, well, obviously that one. Everyone would be that one, wouldn't they? Well, that's what I thought. When I came out onto the stage as Jessica Rabbit, I didn't really feel like Jessica Rabbit because I couldn't really see what I looked like. But I assumed the audience always, they also had that choice. I thought, oh, it'll just be a bunch of sexy people I'm looking at. no. No, it wasn't. Most people in the VR comedy club, by the way, they were all over the world in their headsets, but it's, on my memory is they were all in the room, but they weren't. They were like, one was in Hong Kong, one was in LA, like it was weird as fuck. When I came out expecting to see it, you know, I thought, oh, well, they'll all be Brad Pitt or something and, you know, Jessica Rabbit. Yeah, sure, because that's what people will choose. That's what people will choose. That's what people choose. I don't understand people who do VR clearly because when I came out, like, one of them was a wine bottle, one of them was a donut, <laughs> one of them was a rabbit in a rough. And I went, oh, they've actually opted out of the whole sexy thing. Like, they're just like, they've just said, I don't want to be anywhere on that spectrum. They've just opted out of gender, they've opted out of height, they've opted out of every th- marker. And what was interesting about it is you can't make any assumptions about a rabbit in a rough. And it makes you realise how many assumptions you make about people. So if I'm talking to someone in the audience who I assume is a cisgendered man or I assume is a middle-aged woman or I assume is an older white lady or a young... You know, do you know what I mean? Like, we have got assumptions. And you sort of think, oh, well, I'm a feminist and, you know, I'm... I, no, you make assumptions about people. Of course, of course you fucking do all the time. More than you realise when you're talking to a fucking donut. With legs. Because then you think, well, I don't know anything about this donut. Or how do I approach? How do I approach a donut? And it's like, that's a great question. Because you don't know where they're from. You don't know, like, you, you just don't know anything. And here's the trick. The next night I had to go back and do another set in the same club. 
I met another rabbit in a rough and I was doing like talking to people like this. And I thought, based on last night's rabbit in a rough, I can guess nothing. Because the first rabbit in a rough was a middle-aged man in California. The second rabbit in a rough was a 17-year-old girl in Korea. And I was like, I've got no fucking way of doing bigotry (laughs) at all. I've got no way of going, you know, if one rabbit in a rough is a real dick to me, I have learned nothing about rabbits in roughs. Because the next one, like, I can't do any assumptions. And although I like to think of myself as not a bigoted person, of course, we're all feminists and all of that, but there's just little things and it's so fascinating. And I was just like, everyone should have to spend some time as Jessica Rabbit talking to a wine bottle. (laughs) Everyone should have to do it because it really flips me out. Is there there stuff like that that you do? There is, there's some, they were telling me some stuff about how amazing it can be for trans people, how amazing it can be for people with uh, obvious disabilities, uh, that people stop making assumptions about them. There's all sorts of ways in which it can just be an incredible experience. And they were telling me specifically about incredible experiences. I'm sure, hashtag, not all trans people and not all disabled people want to do this, or maybe you've had a good experience doing it. But there were some of the stories they were telling me were fascinating. Is this some real stuff? Yeah. You don't really know? You just do pirates? Like. Yeah. So accessibility is really, really good. Listen, we should talk to you as well because that sounds really fascinating. And are you, do you have other feminist characters that we can visit? Or is it at the moment it's just the part? I'm thinking a story about Burger Ben who stole her husband to try to take out the underground express trade ship. And- <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you also, just for the people at home, you're doing a VR experience about Bertha Benz who stole her husband's invention and went on a world tour claiming it was hers. <laughs> what I love about the women you choose is that you have none of those Hollywood hang-ups about she's got to be likeable. They're just like, no, just the corrupt, thieving ones. We kind of love it. We kind of love it, though, because we don't have enough female examples of, you know, just like, yeah, she fucking took off. I feel like you, personally, may be going through some kind of reckless, feckless period in your own life where you just want to throw all the toys out of the pram and just go wild. Is that true? I'll discuss that with my therapist. you discuss that with your therapist, Yeah. <laughs> I feel if you're not some kind of pirate with an illicit patent by the end of the year, I'll be very surprised. Um, all right. We've got to go and check that out. What's it called? Uh, the Pirate Queen, which is voiced by Lisa Rue, and it's released in the VR headset. The Pirate Queen, which is voiced by Lucy Liu. And when she said Lucy Liu, everyone went, ooh. <laughs> that really upped people's interest in it. You should lead with that. Um, <laughs> people went... Before, people were like, this is something they've made in their basement. And then when you said Lucy Lou, they went, oh. Now, we don't know if it's the real Lucy Lou or much like Bertha Benz, they've just stolen her voice. Um, it's the real Lucy Lou, I assume. It is the real Lucy Lou. You don't have to take AI voice hacks. Oh, they don't do AI voice hacks. Okay. Um, well, we're very excited for that. We'll all go on. But we've got to get a VR headset to do it, have we? We do. Okay. Are they expensive? Uh, it depends which one you buy. Okay. All right. Well, so we'll try and find a cheap... VR headset that was made ethically, (laughs) brought to our door by someone who pays their tax, (laughs) and then be a pirate. (laughs) All right, are you ready to meet tonight's guest? Now, normally, you know, I have a co-host and a guest, but tonight, uh, this person is a very special friend of mine, and I wanted them to co-host for a while, and I didn't want to basically take up any of their airtime with a second guest. I just wanted to co-host with her um, because she's written a really, really interesting and I think quite groundbreaking novel uh, that's such an interesting discussion. I was like, we don't need anyone else. We just need her and me. Um, She is an absolutely incredible person. My guest and co-host today is a multi-award winning journalist who is currently a columnist at The Guardian and British Vogue. Uh, she co-authored the best-selling book, Slay in Your Lane, The Black Girl Bible, with Elizabeth Uvenbenene, and was named one of the most influential people in London by the Evening Standard in the same year. I was on that list once, but then they took me off. Um, and made the Forbes 30 Under 30 list three years later. Her debut novel, The List, is a remarkable page-turner about secrets, lies, and our lives online. I described it as a genius game-changer, and that's somewhere on the cover 
I just wanted to tell you that because I really mean it. Um, please welcome to the stage the incredible Yami Adekake. Come take a seat. Come take a seat. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hello. <laughs> it's so wonderful to see you, Yomi. Thank you. Um, it's wonderful to see you and your fantastic shoes. Thank you very much. Terribly kind. Yeah, get a moment for the shoes. <laughs> Thank I'm you. I'm a feminist, but the shoes. Yes. <laughs> That's what I care about. <laughs> it's, it, they are, they're quite Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz, aren't they? You feel like if you clicked your heels, you'd be all the way home. Um, but who wants to be home in these shoes? <laughs> they're going out shoes. Um, uh, also... As always, l- absolutely loving everything you're wearing and want Thank to talk. Thank you. These are pajamas. No, they're not. <laughs> but I wanted the whole kind of like pajama. Well, pajama. We haven't pajama, pronounced that pajama chic. <laughs> pajama chic's super in at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, I, th- I like to think so. I'm just very lazy. Um, and this is, in the words of Regina George, this is all that could fit me right now. <laughs> it's quite, I've had a bit of, um, yeah, it's been a bloaty couple of weeks. So yeah, uh, this is nice. And, I don't want to tell everyone this, but yeah. <laughs> Well, it's a confessional show, The Guilty Feminist. People say things they don't mean to say all the time. So uh, could you just tell us, um, I, I absolutely love um, the, uh, the little log line underneath. Um, this is a proof copy. This, is a, this has got, famously got a fabulous cover, but I've brought my proof copy. Um, verified couple, unverified rumours. And that's what the list is about. Can you give your brief sort of pitch for I what what's pitch. the list about you what's think the elevator I get better pitch? Than this i do this like every single day of my life <laughs> i still stammer when it's time um essentially it is a book about the internet that's what i lead with um it focuses on an instagram famous couple called ola and michael um who are due to be married in a month's time a month before the wedding an anonymous list goes up on social media accusing 70 different men of varying degrees of abuse and dun, 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 I'm sure you can see where this is going. Um, Michael, Ola's fiance's name is on the list. Now, Ola, to make things like even worse and even more page turning, <laughs> is, is the phrase, um, Ola is a feminist. Her whole brand is feminism. She essentially has made her name as a feminist journalist. And this is the exact kind of story that she'd normally break and write about. But obviously now it implicates somebody that she's in love with and she's marrying and she's going to have the big OK magazine um, wedding with. And she's essentially got less than four weeks to decide whether she's going to marry him or not. And so she has to decide, does she, she does. believe the anonymous list? And Precisely. could she find out if it's true? Yes. And half of it's written from Ola's perspective. And the other half is written from Michael's perspective, which was really, really interesting to write because I know, like, no men. <laughs> I think I know like six men. <laughs> I, that was he, I think he's written really well, and men have told you he's written really well. They isn't have, he? Yeah. yeah. I think it's really interesting. That was what surprised me when I got the book because I got a proof a while ago, yeah. and I thought this is going to be a diddy or didn't he do it? Yeah. But the second chapter, you go right into his head, and yeah. it's such. I don't think. I just think it's absolute genius. Um, so you kind. You have to because we're friends, but thank you. <laughs> no, no, I don't have to. Am I allowed to say what happens when you go into Michael's head immediately? If it's, it's only oh, chapter absolutely. two. Yeah, I think that will sell it in, actually. That would do me some favours. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. What, this is what fascinated me because I thought the whole thing was going to be we don't know if Michael did it or not and, you know, twists and turns. Chapter two, you're in Michael's head. Michael doesn't know if he did it because Michael's like, what could this mean? Because it's just like a sentence fragment that he's abusive or, you know, and he's like, could it have been, I don't think I've been abusive, but then I did, I guess I liked acted like a fuck boy to that girl. Could that have landed in a way that, and he starts massively questioning everything he's ever done, everyone he's ever slept with, everyone he's ever spoken to and starts analyzing his behavior at a rate of knots that I just thought was so clever because what can land, it's like eggshell skull theory. Does everyone know about the eggshell skull? No, okay. So in law, if you like punch someone in a bar and for most people that would just be like a bit of a black eye, but this person happens to have a skull as fragile as an eggshell and that person dies, you are still down for murder or manslaughter because you, you can't just anticipate that there's not going to be an eggshell skull, if you see what I mean. So it's like, it's still on you. 
And it's so it's it's in law, impact rather than intention, basically, is in law. I studied law and the fact that I'm just learning this in real time is so embarrassing. <laughs> I was with the audience, like, eggshell skull? Did, okay. you, did, you, did you not do you not study eggshell skull in, in law? I mean, to be fair, I failed first and second year of university. <laughs> this is probably why. I didn't know what eggshell uh, do skull Do we have any was. lawyers in? Just give us a cheer if you're a lawyer. Yes, okay. Am I right about eggshell skull? Yes. Okay, great. Damn, Thank you. This is so embarrassing. Thank you. See you guys afterwards. They can explain to me what Excellent. I should know, what I should have learned. So I am, I am right about that. So, so this is a bit eggshell skull because what he's thinking is, I don't think I've been abusive, but I haven't always behaved well. And maybe that's landed with somebody who previously has, have ex, has experienced abuse as a trigger or a, uh, the impact on them was they were traumatized and now they've, joined other women and taken to the internet. And so what's going through his mind is maybe I have because I haven't always acted well. And that just absolutely fascinated me because I went, oh. And I started to think about all the men, certainly the men who were like, you know, celebrities who were famous in the 70s, 80s, 90s, noughties, seven minutes before Me Too happened, who must lie awake at night all the time going, what did I do? well, that was awful. That was terrible. I shouldn't have done that. I was there at the party that night. I didn't say anything. I didn't stop it. And so on and so on. And that must happen all the time. And it really gave me like an insight into the head of men who've behaved badly. But also it's a really interesting examination of what is abuse and what is trauma. Anyway, I would love you on that note to read something from the book. Right. <laughs> Frankie Webb was so casually audacious, you almost had to respect it. Olive begrudgingly found her scrappy, adaptable energy, her air of someone who just missed out on winning The Apprentice, making them all the more ambitious, vengeful even, weirdly admirable. Despite her moneyed background, she could graft like a market trader on Petticoat Lane, had impeccable taste and a keen eye for branding. Her biggest rebrand project was herself, Having edited a slew of women's magazines that peddled eating disorders for the best part of her career, she was an early adopter of brand feminism online when it became clear that print was dying and self-loathing was becoming harder to shift. By the time half of the women's magazine industry as she'd known it had collapsed, she was already preparing to launch the antidote to the disease that she'd helped spread. This coincided with an uptick of the words like empowerment, intersectional, and constantly referring to white men as white men, a move that did little to distract readers from the fact that she was herself white. In 2014, she launched Wiminx, a woman's sexual health platform turned lifestyle brand that released an agenda-setting digital issue every quarter. Frankie hadn't even thought of how it would be pronounced offline, in real life. She chose the name after seeing women, spelt W-O-M-X-N on Twitter, and wrongly assuming that the X had been for aesthetic purposes. But even after that oversight, she managed to spin it into insight, declaring it was pronounced Wominx in a bid to encourage women to embrace their inner minx. What Wominx offered thanks to a whip smart team was genuinely refreshing and purpose-driven, even if the flagrant hypocrisy often made Ola's head spin. For every groundbreaking story they broke on smear tests, there was an advertorial from a brand that had just made headlines for making a woman redundant four months into maternity leave. So, Frankie said, you can probably guess why I've pulled you in for a chat this morning. Yes, and again, I'm really sorry about the delay. Ola cut in and tried to adopt a more apologetic tone, desperate for the conversation to conclude. She shuffled in her chair. I promise I'll have it for you tomorrow. Frankie looked confused for a moment and then howled with sudden realisation. Okay, let me actually explain this. <laughs> so basically, Ola was due to write a um, sort of advertorial, essentially, on a Dutch dildo brand called Calm Take Cut, um, which is CBD infused. <laughs> and um, she hasn't essentially put it in, like she hasn't filed yet. <laughs> so, to, so to speak, so, she hasn't put it in. <laughs> Oh my God, how did I not hear that? <laughs> right, <laughs> yes. Um, because I was just about to say the next bit and I was like, you guys are going to actually think I've lost my mind if I just launch straight into what I'm about to say. Calm take cut, said Frankie. Oh no, no, no. That's a conversation for another day, as in yesterday. Forget about the Dutch dildos woman. That's what I felt the need to explain. <laughs> the list, we need to report on the list. Ola discovered the pit of her stomach was indeed lower than she had initially thought. 
She stared at Frankie dumbstruck, wondering how someone could look quite so upbeat about a feature that depressing, even without your fiancé being accused of physical assault in it. Ola, Frankie clucked. She never did understand why her boss still pronounced her name Ola, yet witted on about her nephew Ollie with no trouble. You mean to tell me you spend all that time on your phone instead of working? I'm still more in the know than you? Ola simply gawked as Frankie continued, voice low as if gossiping. Okay, so this thing called The List went live this morning. Apparently it started out as a Google Doc put together by loads of badass anonymous female journalists, activists, feminists, etc. All the good kind of ists. And now it's a Twitter account that's put all these media bastards on blast. Rapists, sexists, the baddest. Sleaze balls and predators all outed. I know this is very much up your street, so I'm putting you on it. Her boss continued to talk excitedly without pause, seemingly nonplussed by Ola's spooked expression. We need to go beyond the bare bones news story. We need women who are willing to go on the record. You did such a great job with MCs too. I'm sure you'll have no problem getting survivors to tell their stories. And we have to act fast. People are definitely expecting us to break this and we're best poised to. If you could send me a rough pitch by this afternoon, that would be amazing. Frankie waited, finally thrown off by Ola's silence. Does that sound good to you, Ola? At times, Ola felt bad about how little she divulged about her personal life at work. She avoided after-work drinks politely, but like the plague, utilising her gift for storytelling to spin a line on some other imagined post-work commitment she had. Other than with Kiran, she was evasive and vague about everything bar content, and when her colleagues attempted to segue from business into her business, aggressively beaming at the prospect of more than acquaintanceship, Guilt would pull in the pit of her stomach as she firmly declined. Even with her engagement, she wouldn't have broached it at work if Sophie from the fashion and beauty desk hadn't. She reluctantly showed off the small marquise cut diamond sat atop a thin platinum band for all of six minutes before snapping it back to her usual reticence. But in this moment, Ola was reassured that she had been right in maintaining her distance. Her lack of meaningful dialogue with women staff combined with Frankie's inability to retain information that didn't directly affect her meant that Frankie didn't have a clue that Michael had been named. She probably didn't even remember the name of her fiancé, let alone where he'd landed his new job. Shakily, Ola found a smile for her. Sure thing, she said, nodding. I'll send you an outline by two o'clock. As she left Frankie's office and made her way back to the desk, Ola attempted to fix her expression into something less wounded. Her cheeks were prickling with heat, but she managed to remain straight-faced. Darting past her distracted co-workers, she could slowly feel a sense of clarity cutting through her disorientation. She had to keep it together, just for now, and then she would call Michael. She needed to make sense of this. She needed to find out the truth. Thank fuck that's over. (laughs) Jeez! Hello, Guilty Feminist. This is Deborah, and we're recording episodes of The Guilty Feminist, a global pillage of the London Podcast Festival on Saturday the 16th and Sunday the 17th of September. For tickets, go to kingsplace.co.uk. I'll be in Chichester because I've written a play called Never Have I Ever, which will be on in Chichester at the Minerva for the whole of September. It stars Alexandra Roach, Amit Shah, Greg Wise and her very own Susan McComa, and it's about money, sex, power, politics, and running a restaurant. For tickets, go to cft.org.uk. That's cft.org.uk. And we'll be recording more live shows in the autumn, so keep an eye on our website, guiltyfeminist.com. Live shows. You can get ad free episodes via Patreon, Apple Podcasts, or ACAS Plus. And if you're passing iTunes or Spotify, you felt like leaving us a five-star review, we'd love you forever. It helps other people find the show. And now back to the podcast. It's really, really, really well written though. It's okay. funny. It's nuanced. It's uh, It's got great turns of phrase and everything that you're describing there, we can really imagine like the Womix, uh website from somebody who's really just using feminism to make a buck and who was previously had a magazine that was promoting self-loathing and then went, oh, that's not selling anymore. Let's sell CBD-infused dildos and uh, <laughs> next to articles about 
you know, I actually went on a women's magazine the other day for some reason online, and it was a women's magazine that before had only, well, I haven't read women's magazines for years, but my memory of it is all undernourished models and, you know, everything was about dieting or pleasing a man. And now it's all about body acceptance and, and pleasing good. yourself. But like Which the is, great pivot, like it really kind of is like, it's, it is a good thing broadly, but then simultaneously it's like if the, you know, clocks turn back and, you know, everything goes back to how it was, then you kind of feel like they'll also simultaneously go back to how everything was, which isn't... It made me feel very much like if if uh, if various different size models stopped selling tomorrow, stopped selling clothes and stopped selling, you know, whatever it was. Like there was something on there for chub rub shorts. And I was like, this magazine <laughs> would it's never... Like the Daily Mail being like... No. Come on, immigrants, one and all, and you're like, ah, yeah, yeah, exactly. Not really about selling. That. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. It was, I think, it was Cosmopolitan actually, and I was just like, my memory of Cosmo is all like tips to give the perfect blowjob without damaging your manicure. Like it was all that, and now it's like chub rub shorts. Like I was like, no, no, no. It's all chub rub shorts and masturbation techniques, and you know how you can masturbate through your chub rub shorts. I just was like. <laughs> I just couldn't believe it. I was just really like, I was really like, this is a different, this is like if you met an old friend who years ago had been a massive misogynist and you met them and they were like, like a mass, like a man who was a massive misogynist, you met him and he was now doing feminism. You would be as suspicious, you know, you'd be like, why are you saying these things now? Like, glad you're not a misogynist anymore, but also, is this real? And that's how I feel about women's magazines because they only made me feel bad up until sort of like, two Wednesdays ago and now they're trying to sell me no we love you and your body it's an excellent body it's, just, it's the kind of body we love we're not at all for now <laughs> yeah exactly because I've heard that my body which has only briefly come into fashion is going out of fashion again as they, they've just told me it's like oh the year 2000 body's coming back in it's all going to be hair and chic and low slung jeans and I'm like well not for me it ain't but I'm kind of hoping that the online magazine that you're talking about in your book that they're not going to be able to kill variety. I think what we've got at the moment is variety. So even if they try and push hair and chic and low slung jeans, maybe we're going to fight back with... Still be everything else. Well, I'm fighting... I personally be fighting back with my enormous hips, <laughs> which don't lie. <laughs> um, I want to get to the heart of the book, which is... It is a whodunit, really, because we don't know who put this up. And Ola's been in love with Michael and is in love with Michael and wants to marry him. And more than that, they are as a power couple an icon for black love. And I read that you were doing a documentary about black love. Can you tell us a little bit about why you wanted to talk about black people in love in Britain? I wanted to talk about black people in love in Britain because... I don't, want to, I don't want to say very few people do because that would like diminish and erase the work of like the multiple people that do. But very few people do in the mainstream. And I don't think people outside of the black community necessarily even know that black love is a concept or a hashtag or a movement or a thing, which is basically that. Um, so I was meant to be <laughs> um, doing a documentary a couple of years ago um, with Channel 4 and a production company that looked at um, black love, which was basically unpacking the idea that black people in the UK date interracially more than any other ethnic group, which in and of itself is not a negative thing, which I always feel like I really have to stress. It's not a negative thing. But looking at why that's the case and also why, for instance, beauty standards within the black community mean that, um, I'm trying to think of an eloquent way to put this, but the only thing that comes to mind is Kanye West saying, and when he get on, he leave your ass for a white girl. Because <laughs> that was mm. that's kind of sums up like what the sentiment, at least the you know overriding like sentiment and idea has been for some time. Which is that like if you're a successful black man, and the statistics kind of back it up essentially that like there is a reason in our community why black people tend to date interracially more than other ethnic groups um, or any group basically. So. I found that really interesting and it's not like just a small margin, it's like quite steep as in I think it's around 50% within the black community and in every other community it's like maximum around like 
max 20. Um, but then also the jump is specifically with men. Um, and I found I just found it really, really interesting from my kind of an anthropological perspective and kind of wanted to like write about it, like and look at the social reasons as to why. Um, is it rooted by any chance in white supremacy, as most things are? You know, what isn't? <laughs> most, as you said, most things are. Um, but I also think it's really interesting that, for instance, like it affects men differently and kind of disproportionately because not to, you know, make this into, a, a, you know, well, we could talk about this forever, but like the fact that I guess femininity and beauty is seen as something that is very much tied to like lighter skin and, and whiteness and femininity. But then I guess it doesn't necessarily affect black women in the same way because being like dark skin, for instance, is seen as inherently masculine. So black women like preferring often like darker skinned men. It's almost like it's, it's, it's very, very complex, basically, but um, interesting nonetheless. So I wanted to do, you know, a, a piece on it. I found it really interesting that when you think of like high profile power couples that are white in this country, you can like name countless. Um, and then even when you think about black power couples in America, you've got like you know, the Carters and you've got like Ciara and Russell Wilson. And then in the UK, you really struggle to think of like mm. black power couples. So I was meant to be doing a documentary on it. The less said about that, <laughs> the better, because it, it didn't materialise for multiple reasons. But um, I thought it was an interesting thing to look at in um, the the book, the list, because I thought it was interesting to look at how an allegation like this would specifically affect a black couple, especially a dark skinned black couple, because you so rarely see, you know, upwardly mobile dark skin black people in the uk as a union i always say this is why when love island comes on and there's like the one like solitary like token black couple that kind of you know leave the villa it's the response from our community is very intense and i think people externally are just like well, calm down they're just they're just love islanders but often it's like you know part of the very rare representation we get of like two black people visibly on screen like being in love so i felt like the pressures on Oliver and michael as black dark skin um people that have made each other and found love would be different um mm. compared to say people from other ethnic backgrounds i always find it fascinating that say you know if you saw the hashtag white love of course you'd be like this is like white supremacy likely <laughs> like probably something I, mean, I have no doubt it probably exists somewhere um amongst like the trump supporting demographic but i feel like even in other minoritized groups like you don't really see like hashtag asian love hashtag like um hispanic love because it's not as rarefied to see mm -hmm. couples that are high profile that are both you know um from the same ethnic background so i thought it was important to kind of unpack why their downfall or a michael would be even more dramatic compared to like if they were from a different ethnic group Yes, that, that makes a lot of sense. I remember um, the, the first time I really understood this, Susan McComer was on the show and she told a story about when she was a little girl, she was like six or seven at school and she was like really getting on well with this boy in the playground and it was sort of like, will you be my boyfriend type thing? And he really liked her and he said, I can't though because you're, he was black as well and he said, you're too dark skinned. And he knew as a tiny child, it's like you have to have a lighter skinned girlfriend. And she didn't understand. She didn't know what he meant. Like, she was really upset by it because they really liked each other. And it was just like, obviously, six or seven. It's just like, I have a friend hold my hand or, you know, whatever. And she, then that's when she found out, like, oh. And so it's a real thing. And there's all sorts of origins. Uh, I was going to gonna say, even, I feel like he learned that literally. I can see the sitcoms he watched. I'm like, did he watch My Wife and Kids? Did he watch, like, mm. because there were so many. When I, I have friends that literally were like, they actually thought, um, like in nature that like you would be darker skinned if you were male because you'd watch these random like 90s um shows of like african-american protagonists and then the <laughs> it's not actually funny but like the dad would be really dark skinned and then he'd have a really dark skinned son and then they'd have like a mixed race mum and then the daughter would also be mixed race and it was almost like genetically like to be a like like to cast a black guy they'd have to be dark skinned but then the female counterparts it's like a whole thing if you guys google it you'll see like think back to like most like sitcoms you watched in the 90s that had like black characters usually the women were lighter and the guys were darker and people i think a lot of people actually thought that's kind of just what happens in nature and it's like no this is casting <laughs> like this is quite like you know it's deliberate deliberate i really notice that now in you know when things are cast in a really race blind way that i really see it now 
because Susie pointed it out to me, and she's a very close friend of mine, that you'll see dark-skinned men and then you'll see really light-skinned women and mixed-race women, but they'll have very European features generally. And it's like, we've done the job, diversity. But we are still not seeing a lot of dark-skinned women on the screen. And, and by the way, I love all the actresses who are being cast and I want them to have roles. I don't want to take roles away from them, but I'm just like, also, can we see some dark-skinned women on, on screen? And so what happened to your documentary? Um, <laughs> you know what? It would be a great companion piece I feel like this, if I Channel talk about it, the list. this will be a very short episode. <laughs> I feel like we'd have to um, annex about 70% of what I say. But um, yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't great. But we move because I got a massive book and <laughs> I'm adapting that for TV. It's so I'm like, it's pretending a shame the Channel, Channel 4 thing didn't happen. Yeah, because Channel 4 could have a brilliant companion documentary to the list right now because the list is the book of the summer. It's a hit book and what a great, what a great <laughs> companion documentary they could have if they'd made it. Um, they must be kicking themselves. So we've got this sort of power couple. Yeah. There's this extra element where the black community are looking at them as, you know, icons and yeah. aspirational and there they are on Instagram. People are really rooting for them. And then this accusation is made. Mm. And nobody knows who made it. What made you want to write about this? So I wanted to write about this because around, yeah, 2017, there were loads and loads of different lists sort of disseminating around the internet that were quite similar to the one that I wrote written about in the novel. And I think my knee-jerk reaction as a feminist was like, this is incredible. Um, and in many ways, I still think... It is and certainly important and I definitely understood the need for it because I felt like when you as a survivor have been let down by literally every conceivable system whether that's like all the way from HR to like the police and like the legal system like what else is there left to do simultaneously I want to be like because I studied law but I'm like I barely did clearly because I don't know like what the thing you just referenced um I like with my like kind of uh, you know adjacency to law and also being um, a journalist that, you know, worked at like, um, you know, was was very much kind of held by Ofcom regulation and like, you know, binded by it. I kind of had, and also I suppose being in the throes of a fake news crisis and just understanding also how things can be weaponized. Things with the greatest intentions can be weaponized online because that's the nature of online. It's completely unregulated. So I guess it was kind of a, you know, I guess unease, not with the need to discuss these things and even anonymously, just understanding that I've watched Catfish essentially and just understand that like it's not difficult for people to access things that they're not supposed to access and then weaponize it. I mean, speaking even up to like, there have been so many fantastic movements online that have given a voice to people who would essentially be voiceless, but I think it would be naive to suggest it's impossible because of the nature of the internet and anonymity online in particular, that those things can't be weaponized and be essentially taken over by people that don't have the best intentions, essentially. And so I just thought it was, you know, more than interesting. I felt really conflicted, to be perfectly honest. And I didn't think it was necessarily a fashionable viewpoint at the time and Felt, but still also felt it was important because at the end of the day, I care about justice and I care about movements being utilised by those who need them most and not giving space and scope to people who do want to use, you know, these systems for ill, essentially. Um, because I want, I think I've said this to you before, that, like, the thing that really scares me about the internet, as someone who has had, like, images of them... Um, used by people who have purported to be me it's actually really awkward trying to explain to people that like i'm not on hinge <laughs> and they're like oh. yes you are but you've changed your name to sarah and i'm like no that's just literally someone using my pictures like it's actually not me um that which again to me shows how easy it is to just like enter a space that you're not supposed to be in um so basically i guess i had that unease and i wanted to have a conversation about it and i wanted to do so in a way that felt nuanced and gray so i wanted to write a non-fiction sort of long read on it 
And then I think it was just slightly too early because I was trying to do it in like in 2017. And then I put the idea in a like you know in a drawer somewhere. And then I came back to it a couple of years later as like a play. And like yeah, again, the less said about that, the better because I've never written a play in my life, and it like for good reason it wasn't particularly good. And then it was lockdown and. I can't cook and I can't bake and that's what everyone else is doing so I was literally like I have endless amounts of time I could try and write this as fiction and that's how yeah um I ended up doing it and another reason again I thought it was important not in the least arrogant way possible I thought it was important for me to do it or someone like me to do it is because I really feel like we're in this weird position now where certain conversations are being commandeered by the wrong people and we're leaving all these conversations to right-wing people and it really stresses me out because there are uncomfortable conversations to be had about multiple different things. And then what happens is we're like, you hear like cancel culture and you just see Nigel Farage frothing at the mouth. And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, I completely understand why it's become like a right-wing dog whistle. But if we leave that conversation to right-wing people, they commandeer it and it becomes theirs. Mm -hmm. And they're able to say like, this is what cancel culture is and this is why blah, blah, blah. And then what happens is on the left, there's just a chasm of loads of things we're not discussing. And I just really felt this was one of those things because the internet's fucking terrifying. <laughs> I was yes. like, yeah. I, I agree with this. I'm actually writing a book called Six Conversations We're Scared to Have. Which I'm excited for. Um, Very excited. Which is about this kind of thing because I also want to have the conversations but with our team. <laughs> because looking away from things and pretending there are no flaws is a problem I do not, like, Me Too has immeasurably changed my mental health in my life. Like, it has, like, fully has. I used to have arguments with men all the time where I would end up crying because, and I felt like I was being gaslit. I was like, I can see sexual harassment. I've experienced it. I've experienced the, the, the way women are treated in comedy. I've, in terms of marginalisation, I've experienced these things. I can see intersectional issues. And I used to, re and they used to look at me like, you want unfair treatment. And so I would feel like mad. I'd feel like I was insane. And I probably shouldn't, that's not inclusive language, is it? What would I feel? Someone tell me? What should I say? Okay. I'm just going to say insane. We'll find out. I, exactly. We'll the internet will tell us. Later. Um, I, I would feel insane. And now, post me too, if they're in a green room going, oh, there's no real problems, they're the ones that everyone looks at like, mm, what year do you think this is? And that has changed my mental health massively. And I think just the acknowledgement, acknowledgement. Yeah. yeah I, I read once that a lot of trauma is lack of a credible witness. And I feel like that's true. I feel like sometimes something happens, it's acknowledged and you process it and you can release a lot of the trauma. But if no one will hear you and no one will see you and you think, did this happen to me? Or can somebody just acknowledge it happened to me? If we, if we get no acknowledgement, it, you carry it in your body in a different way. And so I desperately need me too in my life. And I do not want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I feel what your book is saying is if we do not allow the baby to grow up, the bath world is getting cold. Like we have to, do you see what I mean by this? Like we have to let the baby grow up. So there's conversations about internet anonymity, for example. And Yomi, you said backstage, you keep getting asked at the moment about high profile cases, yeah. but they're high profile cases with credible witnesses, this is exactly legal what I cases. Keep saying. I keep saying that like when people ask me what's the book about, I'm always like, it's about the internet. It's about the internet. Because it is about the internet. Like, I always say I could have written this about TripAdvisor. Like, literally. Like, a girl who runs, you know, a bakery or something has all these anonymous reviews. Are they real? Like, it's literally that simple because it's the internet. And I think this is what frustrates me sometimes with the conversation around... Because people, at times, I think the most base reading is like, oh my God, is this an anti-council culture scribe? Or is this like a whole screed about, like you know, um, you know, anti-Me Too movement. I'm like, not remotely. It's because I care about the Me Too movement mm. that I'm saying that the internet means you can literally... I always say, I could, you know... I mean, aside from you guys, I could literally go home right now and be like, I um, was in the audience of Guilty Feminist on a burner account and be like, 
and Deborah Francis White was, you know, she stabbed me. Let's just take this to the most extreme <laughs> like level. And there's nothing about sanity that stops me doing that or mm-hmm. you doing that or any one of you doing that mm-hmm. because that's what the internet allows because it's the internet. And I think having, it's the same it's the same way I feel protective over like Black Lives Matter. I feel protective over anything that empowers people to speak truth to power. I just think that a critical approach, not to the movement, but to the fact that it's basically sort of happening, like unfolding on the internet, which is completely unregulated, mm-hmm. in which I can still, you know, find myself somehow on hinge, even though I swear I'm not. I feel like the lady doth protest too much, but I like genuinely am not. Because <laughs> I'm constantly finding myself on dating sites um, and just randomly being u- my image being used in different ways that makes me realise like, wow, you can kind of do anything on this Weird thing and yeah. we don't really talk about it. Every yeah. single tool in the history of the world has been used as a weapon. Yeah. Since somebody picked up a stick and went, oh, this would be good for, you know, preparing food or whatever, <laughs> but washing clothes or whatever, you know, everything, every tool is used as a weapon. Sometimes there's a call for like due process, due process, and I'm like, but we never get the process we're due. Exactly. So it, it's no good to use, you know, it's like, oh, you can't flout the law. The law has always flouted us. The law has always flouted women. Yeah. So for me, it's not about, well, due process, like, well, if you... If that really happened, why didn't you go to the police right away? Because we know the kind of thing that the police say and we know and we understand the history of the world. And the internet, as you say, is the Wild West. It's completely unregulated. And anybody, anybody at all can go on the internet and say anything about anybody. And if we, if we lump that in with believe women and believe survivors, because one anonymous person on the internet said it, we are diminishing... The, the art, we're diminishing our own argument. And yet I don't know what really to do about that because someone may only feel safe saying it on the internet anonymously. That's the problem. Which, exactly, which is something I try to unpack in the book, which is just the reality that, I mean, I keep saying to people, I hope you don't read this looking for a single answer, which isn't probably the best way to sell it, but like there no, but aren't it, any answers in it because uh, I don't know. But it's very much giving like, I'm a feminist and I'm a feminist and I absolutely understand that the internet is super powerful and is a double-edged sword and of course can be weaponized. And yeah, it's something I think that any person who cares about the movements they're part of has no choice but to think about. Otherwise you leave it to Nigel Farage and then you leave it to fucking governors in Alabama or wherever who chat shit and constantly want to stop us saying anything. <laughs> the great thing about fiction is that one, it may not contain any answers this book does start a very important conversation i don't have the answers you don't have the answers but i think together we might have the answers i hope if we will discuss it and i think at the moment we avoid conversations in case somebody thinks we're saying something we're not saying i genuinely lie awake at night terrified that like some incel like what's the word Andrew Tate types going to be like so I read this book and actually and that like the weaponization of people trying to use that to then flout like the reality of Mm -hmm. um the fact that 99% of allegations are true really terrifies me but simultaneously this is why I think the element of the internet is so important because I'm always saying that the internet is very different I think and I think it's opened kind of a Pandora's box that we're just not reckoning with and every so often something comes out that makes me go, oh God, like we're not discussing this as liberal people, which then leaves it again, as I keep saying. No, I don't know why Nigel Farage has like, become the star of the, of the show. No, no. But yeah, but it Nigel it, Farage yeah. is going like, to... We can't leave all difficult conversations because we do not actor. want nuance, because we can't handle nuance. We can't leave it over there because we think, oh, they'll pick up what we're saying and they'll run with it. It's like, well, we doesn't matter what they're saying. They're going to say a load of shit anyway. anyway yeah. So let's take control of the means of those conversations. And I think this book is a really great place to start. So I would recommend you read this book. It's a real page turner and it's very beautifully written. It's quite literary as well as it being a real gripping page turner. I would recommend you read it. I'd recommend you get your friends to read it. And I'd recommend you talk about it because I do think we need to start having some of these conversations. It's time. And it wasn't time a few years ago, I would say. It wasn't time immediately. As I say... We don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, so we need to let the baby grow up. Mm. 
Yomi, I'm so excited that you've come onto the show and talked about your book. And we normally open with, but today I thought it would be more fun to close with. Let's play I'm a Feminist But. Hey! Okay, I'll start. I am a feminist, but I recently found out that when sleazy men check out or try to talk to my goddaughter, she loves telling them, I'm 13. <laughs> Because it freaks them out and they run away. So now I use it. <laughs> and this is true. Uh, a guy, I was walking up the, the sort of like at the escalator. You know how you can walk up the escalator on the tube? And a guy just went, oh, nice ass," Which admittedly, I do have a nice ass. <laughs> but I was just like, so inappropriate, you know? And it could be somebody I didn't really care about. I just was like, oh, fuck you. But I, but I thought someone else might. So I thought I've got to do something about this. And I had it in my head. It was went, nice ass. So I turned around and went, I'm 13. <laughs> and it's, um, it's magical because he didn't know what to do. I think he looked at me like, do you have an aging disease or something? Like, I don't know now. And am I going to be called ableist if I say you're not? Like, he just didn't know what to do. And he was just like, oh, he was really thrown by it. And now it's my secret weapon. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but... I do marketing for BMW. No, I don't. <laughs> I don't, I don't. I'm a feminist, but I don't believe in male or female jobs, but I do believe it's a man's job to take the bins out. Yeah. Yes? Can I get an amen? Thank you, girl. Thanks, sister. I feel the same about the kitty litter. That is for, that is for boys. Come on, yeah, we've guys. Got kitty Come on. It's like a little robot thing that goes around, so when the cat, after the cat's gone to the loo, you can press a button and it d- puts the bad litter down, um, filters out, whatever. It doesn't matter. The point is I've For never... men or robots, I've basically. never... I've, yeah. Well, the robot does that part and then someone has to empty it. It's not me. <laughs> I've never emptied it once and I'm really proud of it. This is the kind of thing we want AI for, though. That's what I don't understand. Why do AI... AI wants to go straight to fucking writing screenplays. I had to wait tables. AI can fucking wait tables. <laughs> And I know there's AIs out there going, I've been working as a self-service checkout in Tesco for 10 years, mate. It's time for my screenplay. Fair. Fair Tesco's checkout. Listen, if the Tesco's checkout's got a screenplay, I'll read it. I'm open to it. But none of these new Johnny-come-lately CGPT chats or whatever they're called, those guys can fuck off. They can do their time. They can work in a pub. 10 years then I'll read their fucking screenplay we all had to we had to do our time didn't we we had bad jobs um I'm a feminist but I really want to start the I'm 13 campaign (laughs) where all women lie about their age (laughs) to wolf whistlers and so on and I don't feel bad about it because loads of women I know lie about their age anyway I'm open to women lying about their age only because, I'll tell you why, the patriarchy is ageist. And sometimes we just need to do what we need to do to get by in the world. That's all I'm saying. I think that's I'm a feminist and, I'm sorry. I don't think there's a but about it. It sounds pretty feminist there, to me. There are some feminists. The feminist. Chinese pirate game, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there are some feminists who would be like, no, no one must ever lie about their age. Do you know French women lie and say they're older? Is, oh, is this true? We've got someone French in the audience. Um, is it, can you verify this, that some French women lie about their age and say they're older? So if they if say they're like 38, they say they're 45. So people go, oh, my God, you look so young. Is that true? Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. You're not sure? But go and look it up. Go and ask, ask other French women. How old are you? On Hinge 53, an example. Um, you might see her on a Hinge. <laughs> Deb. <laughs> um, I'm a feminist and... Oh, oh God, I really but, adopt this and now. Yeah, yeah. I'm a feminist, but I wrote a column on the fact that I thought it was really important that we needed to divest from beauty standards and we needed to kind of usurp the idea that, you know, women needed to be beautiful um, and that it was part of our value system, essentially. And then two men were debating whether I was right in writing this because they felt I had pretty privilege, and I was really happy. <laughs> oh! I was thrilled. <laughs> I was like, 
like, oh, what? Oh, oh my God! I, love this. I would so, love I'm so that. I'm so sorry. Yeah, patron saint of uh, feminism. You're so death. right. I really. But I was so have happy no about that. to write this because of my pretty privilege. I know they were. Yeah, <laughs> they back and forth, and I was like mentally yeah. favoring each tweet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. God. No authority to write it due to your pretty privilege. <laughs> Absolutely. Leave that to others, Yomi, who are not stunningly beautiful. I mean, I would be thrilled. I would be thrilled forever if I got that. I would print that out and I'd put it on my wall. Keeps me warm on my coldest night. Yeah. I'd, <laughs> if that happened to me, I'd frame that. But no oh, one has said it. Somewhere. It's somewhere. It's a couple of years ago. Why has no one said it? I'm a feminist, but I feel like if we all did the I'm 13 campaign, we could confuse all the catcallers and inappropriate men in London, nay the world, with this collective lie. But only if we rope the actual 13-year-olds into our campaign... And I'm not sure that's ethical, but I'm fully open to it. <laughs> so everyone 13 and up, when looked at, harassed, like, you know, like, you know, when guys are like, eh, you know, with any kind of aggressive, aggressive staring is not allowed on the tube anymore. Have you seen that? You're allowed to report someone for sexual staring. And seriously, the signs have gone up. If anybody does any of those things, I think, could we make a pact in this room that our new strategy, let's all just try it for a couple of weeks, see how it goes, <laughs> is to just go, oh, I'm 13. <laughs> And just, can you just report back, either at our socials or you could just email guiltyfemist at gmail.com and could you just report back and let us know how it goes and what reactions that you get from men. I think they're going to start running away and I think they're getting scared. If enough of us do it, they're going to stop because they're going to be like, I don't want to be arrested. <laughs> oh, this is making me feel bad. This is making me feel wrong. But you don't flinch. You don't apologise. You never take it back. You refuse to show ID if asked. You're just like, I am 30... I don't have a driver's license. I'm fucking 13, mate. I carry ID. Okay, I'm a child. <laughs> Unbelievable. I just really want to do it so much. I just want to, I want a whole worldwide global campaign. I've only tried it once so far, but I really, I'm a feminist, but I really want a man to harass me tonight so I can use it. <laughs> I'm just desperate for that to happen. Um, can I just say a huge, huge, huge thanks to the incredible Yomi Adekake? <laughs> just give us a cheer if you're going to buy the list. <laughs> you don't need to... I mean, yeah, you're a Sunday Times bestseller list now for a few, a few weeks. For another week, thanks to here. Um, yeah, I mean, as far as Yomi's publishers are concerned, you don't have to read it, you just have to buy it. But I would like you to read it. I want you to read it. I want you to talk about it with people. I want you to share it. I want you to, to just have the conversation. It's a really uncomfortable conversation to have, but this book makes it not uncomfortable because you've got fictional characters who are talking to each other and they are not real. So you can like have that conversation through, I think fiction and drama and things like that are so such wonderful ways to have conversations. Speaking of which, I've got a play in Chichester all of September called Never Have I Ever, which has some interesting conversations in it. Uh, and you just... Do you do, I don't know if anyone knows about this, but if you write fiction, you just put different com things in people's mouths and you don't have to believe any of them. <laughs> and they can just talk to each other and you can go, I think a bit of this. And I've sometimes thought that because none of us have just these pure thoughts in our heads. You know, like all of the time we think all of the things that we're meant to think that we've Except been told on Twitter. to think. Hmm? Except on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, but people pretend on Twitter that they think all of those things. All of us have got nuance in our head. All of us have got, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, but also what about this? And fiction is a great place to have those conversations when we need to be getting it off the page and off the stage and also into the pub uh, and be able to argue well. Speaking of off the stage, Deb. <laughs> you have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis Wright, and my very special guest, Yomi Adekake. The recording engineer was Grundy Liz Ember, and music was by Mark Hodge. The producer was Tom Selinski for the Scottish Lady Shop. Thanks to Rachel Croft and Gina Dizio, Zainab Mohammed, and everyone at Zoe Theatre, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. I've been Deborah Francis Mike. Good night. Well, it's a confessional show, The Guilty Feminist. People say things they don't mean to say all the time. <laughs> On that, we're going to talk about some big things tonight. Um, and the great thing about coming to the Guilty Feminist Live is people say things all the time that they ask to have cut out of the show because they don't want them on the internet. Um, 
I sometimes say this story, I cannot tell this story on the podcast because the podcast lives on the internet and that is where this story cannot be. Um, and so some things Yomi says tonight, she may ask, can they be cut out? So if she says anything like where you go, wow, I can't believe she said that, can you just wait till it's released? See if she said it on the internet and then you can talk about it. But up until that point, just take it to the grave. Like literally everything I've said up to this point will not be in this podcast. <laughs> okay, right. Do you want me to introduce you again? <laughs> if you don't mind, I'm taking no. Um, uh... The Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.